if you've got your Bibles this morning, I'd like you to open them to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Pastor Chad has been in a series, The Big Four, and it's a series about uh, four basic fundamental disciplines we all need to have in our lives to be successful, powerful followers of Christ. And the first week he talked about having an, an unoffendable spirit. That's a great discipline to have, that you're the kind of person that just, you know, you're not important. Christ is important. You're unoffendable. The last week he talked about what? What did he talk about last week? You may remember? Joy. Why you, joy. You guys, you guys got that? I got one person. Joy. We enjoy. Today we're going to talk about prayer, and next week we'll be back and talk about thankfulness. He's away this weekend. We encourage him to get away and pray and seek the Lord, so I'm glad he's doing that. But today we're going to talk about prayer. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica, Paul the Apostle. And what's happened is Paul went on a missionary journey, his first missionary journey. He ended up in a town called Philippi, which would be in modern-day Greece as we know it today. And he was there for a little while, and he traveled south to a town called Thessalonica, and he spent three Saturdays, Shabbats, they call them there, in the synagogues, and he would go into the synagogue, there's probably one in Thessalonica, with the Jewish uh, people that were there, and he would argue with them, because he was a Jewish teacher himself, and he would argue with them about Jesus, and preach them the gospel that Jesus was the Messiah, the one they were looking for, and, and many Jewish folks became followers of Christ, and many Greeks as well, but it started to heat up. He had all kinds of persecution and problems and opposition, and so he and his companions had to leave and travel south, further down south into Greece, in a town called Corinth, and that's where he was when he wrote, we believe he wrote this letter to the church in Thessalonica. And he wrote it to them because he knew that the opposition that he had experienced to the gospel and preaching it, they were continuing, uh, continuing to experience. And he wanted to stay encouraged and strengthened. And so from Corinth, he writes this letter to them. And he's challenging them because he doesn't want them to fall away in the faith. And he writes to them in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. He says, pray without ceasing. In fact, the whole passage, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 to 18 says, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. The pastor talked about that last week. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks. He's going to talk about that next week. In all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So today we're going to talk about prayer. And the thing I want to say to you today, and the main point I want to drive home, is that prayerful people know that you cannot walk with God and not talk with God. When, when Paul says, pray without ceasing, the Greek word there is prosukamai. I can't, I can't get the sound right. It's really like prosukamai, but I can't say it. Some of you who come out of dialects where you can phlegm better than I can, can say that appropriately. I can say it like pastor, prosukamai, or whatever. I can't say it like him either, right? I say like a Yankee with my nasal tone voice, but but uh, prosukamai it, it just meant to pray. It meant to speak to her or to to make requests of God. It was a, a term that meant dialogue. It meant talking to the Lord. And in fact, when the Jewish people in the in the dispersion, when they were when they were persecuted and kind of spread throughout the Roman world, that little uh, place in Thessalonica, one of the things that they would do wherever they went is they would pr- set up a place of prayer. And they called it a prosuke, a place of prayer. And it would often be, if they didn't have a synagogue, it would often be down by a river because they needed water for some of their ceremonial washings for their worship. And it was called a place of prayer. Well, we know that when Christ died, the temple veil was torn in half. And the Bible says in the New Testament that you and I would become followers of Christ. We are the what of the Holy Spirit? The temple, right? The temple Holy Spirit. That we are to be a prosuke. We are to be a place of prayer. And prayer, quite simply, is just dialogue with the Lord. It's talking with the Lord. Prayerful people know that you cannot walk with God and not talk with God. You know, there's a lot of bad news in the news. And I'm sure you're like me. A lot of it, you just tune out because there's so much of it. But every once in a while, something happens and it just touches your heart, right? And puts a burden there. And you know, this shooting that happened in California, I think it was at a country western bar a few weeks ago. Man, that just, just kind of tore me up inside. And we had Michael W. Smith here in concert a couple weeks ago. And for those who are younger, you don't know who he is, the older folks know who he is. He was a 
is and was a great worship leader, a uh, great uh, Christian artist, great songs, those kind of things. In fact, right here is the X on the, on the ground where, where he stood in the concert. I'm saying where Michael W. Smith stood. Come on, isn't that awesome? Right here, right here, right here. Awesome, who cares, right? Anyway, he had a song he wrote for Cassie Bernal, and she was one of the young ladies that was killed in the Columbine shooting several years ago. And before he introduced the song, he said, he mentioned the shooting in California, and he said, you know, when is it going to stop? And I'm not here today to begin a dialogue about politics and gun control. I am here to say that I think what our nation needs, like all nation needs, is it needs a sovereign move of God. And if I can say it this way, I know it's not good grammar, what the world needs, what it really needs, what it doesn't need, let me say it that way, what the world does not need is a dead church. Because you can't legislate the human heart. And I believe in the church. I believe the church has a message. I believe it has the gospel that nobody else has. And there are awesome groups of people who aren't the church that do incredible charity work of feeding uh, people who are hungry and clothing the poor and educating folks. And I believe in all those things. And I think the church should be doing those things and more. But the church primarily must be the place that carries the gospel to the world. And when we think about the news that's going on in our culture, what our country needs, what every nation needs, is they need a church that is alive and not dead. And you and I are the church. This building isn't the church. This gathering is just a bunch of people together. But you and I, as the temple of the Holy Spirit, we are the church. As we go out into the world, what the world needs is an alive church. And we're not going to be an alive church without prayer. We're not going to be that. I've had the privilege of being married to a super hot lady for 23 years, my wife Amy over there. First time I saw her on campus, I thought to myself, good job, God. That's what I thought. <laughs> and, and we married 23 years. We dated for six years. And, uh, and, uh, and, and it was that long because her father kept telling me no every time I asked about marrying, which was smart on his part. I just wore him down finally. That's all it really was. And it's, it's no secret that one of the key ingredients in marriage is communication, right? That's no secret. In fact, I would say in general, that's the, the big secret to a lot of relationships, even within companies and endeavors, communication, you know, organizations, communication, relation communication. But one of the things that marriage counselors tell people all the time in marriage is you got to talk to one another. You got to listen to one another. You got to make some time for each other. You got to have your date nights. You've got to do those things. And there's lots of ingredients that are important to be in a marriage, but communication is one of them. You know, the Bible compares the church to a bride and calls Jesus the groom. The Bible gives that analogy of the bride and groom, of the husband and wife. And we as a church are the wife, and Christ is the husband. And we all know that if human relationships need communication, how much more I walk with the Lord. In fact, my main point, if there's anything I want you to take home tonight, to this morning, pardon me, is a very simple statement. Prayerful people know that you cannot walk with God and not talk with God. Prayerful people know that you cannot have a relationship with the Lord. You cannot walk with God and not talk with God. Well, what is prayer? When Paul wrote, pray without ceasing, that Greek word there is prosukamai. I can't get the sound. It's really prosukamai, but I can't, I can't phlegm well, okay? I'm a Yankee. I can nasal tone really well, but other things, I can't do that. I always, Pastor Chad and I have been on the radio before, and I've always said, this is not in my notes, and Pastor Mark's right now saying to me, I can hear my head, stick to your notes. But, um, I hate being on the radio with him listening to myself because I sound like a guy in New York like hailing a cab and he sounds like Andy Griffith. You know, he has this lovely, you know, you want to listen to his voice. Mine like, oh, dear Lord. So anyway, oh, well, each has their own gifts. What is prayer? Prosukamai. That Greek word means to pray, to speak to, to make requests of God. It means just to talk to God. In fact, interestingly enough, when, when Jewish um, communities were dispersed because of persecution, all kinds of things, and ended up in places like Thessalonica, they would often have a place of prayer. It was often down by a river if they couldn't build a synagogue, right? And that was because water was a part of the ceremonial washings that they would partake in in a part of their worship. And they called that, pla that place prosuke, a place of prayer, right? And then in the New Testament... The Word of God says that since when Christ died and the temple veil was torn in half, the Spirit of God comes to live in us once we are forgiven of our sins through the blood of Christ, right? Spirit of God comes in us that we are the temple, what? Of the who? 
The Holy Spirit, right. We are the temple. We are prosuke. We are to be ourselves as followers of Christ, a place of prayer. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? In fact, they would take the talit, that prayer shawl, and they would hold it over their heads and they would make a little tent of prayer with that shawl. You've seen Pastor Chad do that here sometimes on Sunday mornings as an example. Prayer is quite simply dialogue with the Lord, conversation with the Lord. Prayerful people know you cannot walk with God and not talk with God. And why is this important? Why does it matter? Well, there's a lot of different reasons. One of them is that God wants to have an intimate relationship with you. But, but I want you to, for a moment, I want you to think about our world. I want you to think about our culture. It's very disturbed by the recent shooting in California in a country western bar. You know, and, and there's bad news all the time in the news, Right? But you ever notice every once in a while, one of those news stories, it just kind of strikes a chord in your heart. You know, it, it just makes you stop. The other week, Michael W. Smith was here. For you young folks, he was a Christian singing artist, still is. Was standing right here on this stage. In fact, there's an X for him for his spot. I'm standing where Michael W. Smith stood. Look at that. How exciting is that? Anyway. And, you know, he's, he wrote this song for Cassie Bernal, who was a young lady that was killed in the Columbine shootings. You all, all old enough to remember that tragedy, that high school? And, and before he sang the song, he mentioned the shooting in California, and he said, when is it going to stop? Now, I'm not here today to begin a dialogue with you politically about gun control and everything, everything else. But I think we could all agree on this. Something is wrong with our country. Something's wrong with people. You can't legislate the heart. And when I think about that, what I think is, what does the world need? Well, I know one thing the world does not need. It doesn't need a dead church. People can do religion really well because religion takes very little effort because religion doesn't cause you to change. It lets you walk through some motions and then just go live your life however you want to. I believe that the church is the most powerful institution on the face of the planet Earth. Because the church has the gospel message of grace and nobody has that. Lots of people have charities and they help the poor and feed the hungry and they help the widows and orphans. And I love those efforts and the church should be doing that and more. Absolutely. But the one thing the world doesn't have the church has is the, the message of the gospel of grace. And we have to be an alive church. We can't be a dead church. And the church isn't this room filled with people. The church is you and I. The church is you and I. That's why prayer is important. That's why these big four are important. That's why prayerful people know that you cannot walk with God and not talk with God. Dr. Ralph Martin said, prayer is at its root simply paying attention to God. Oswald Chambers says, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. We all want to do things on our own. We want to be self-sufficient. It's the human heart. It's pride. But God says, if you want to follow me, you have to humble yourselves and you have to seek me because what I want to do, what I want to do through you is not something you can do in yourself. The life I've called you to live, you can't live it in your own power. And the world needs a church that can't, that's not doing things in its own power. The world needs a church that's doing things by the Spirit of God. That's what they need. And I pray for another great awakening in our country. And I pray we'll send more people to a place that never heard the gospel. What are those four types of prayer I want to talk about this morning? If you're a note taker, they're in your notes. Using a simple acronym, PRAY. P-R-A-Y. You know, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. And he taught them a prayer. It's called the, Lord, the Lord's Prayer, right? You guys know this? Say it with me, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our trespasses and forgive those who trespass against us. I, I skipped the whole uh, give us our daily bread part. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is what you get when you get plan B in the pulpit. So anyway, some, some pastor, I've often asked the Lord, God, would you make me if I had the wrong personality? But anyway, you know, Jesus is teaching them this prayer. And in this prayer, there are four things you're going to see consistently. And the first thing, P, is praise. He says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's a praise statement. 
And when we pray, when we worship, we sing, prayer is, a part of prayer is praising God. Not because God has an, you know, is having an ego trip, but because God needs us to say out loud as much as possible who he is, to worship him, to acknowledge the truth of who he is. Not only so that we can worship, but also so we can hear ourselves speak the truth about God. Prayer is praise. Hallowed be your name. The next letter in the acronym pray, R, means repent, right? Forgive us our sins. You cannot come to God with an unrepentant heart. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Prayer is a place of coming before God in honesty. Honesty about our mistakes. Honesty about our, about our sins. Honesty about stuff that we, maybe we didn't even know we've done. But God, we, when we come to pray, you know, God's not shocked when we've blown it. It doesn't surprise him right? He's not surprised. Praise and repent are two types of prayer. The third letter in pray, A equals ask, right? Give us this day our daily bread. The part I skipped earlier, (laughs) give us this day our daily bread, right? We're allowed and supposed to and should come before the Lord. I think sometimes we're really good at the ask part, maybe not the repent and the praise part, right? But Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Right? The Lord said, If you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you as well. God is not annoyed by you coming to him and talking to him. In fact, the disciples would get frustrated a couple of times with children coming to Christ and he tried to, you know, hey, 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 this is important stuff. Kids, stay away. And Jesus said, No, 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 no. Let the little children come unto me for such is what? The kingdom of what? Heaven. Right? Children, children, if they're hungry, they just ask, right? Or if they're a baby, they just cry. You know, one of the things that God loves to hear is his children just crying out to him. And we can be honest. And I think sometimes we think as Christians we can't be honest with the Lord, but it it might encourage you to read the Psalms because the Psalms are filled with brutally honest prayers that are filled with praise, but also honesty, crying out to God. My God, my God, where are you? My eyes fail looking for you. Why have you forsaken me? The statement Jesus made on the cross, my God, was a psalmist cry. So we can come before God and we can ask. 1 Timothy 2 says, First of all, I then urge you that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. God wants us to ask. The why in pray. So we got praise, repent, ask. The why in pray means yield. This might be the hardest part of prayer. At least it is for me. James 4, 1 says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. God opposes the proud, he goes on to say, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Prayer is yielding ourselves to the Lord. So Reverend Brian McPhail said this. He said, the key to prayer is to pray as Christ would pray. This means that prayer is not bending God's arm to give us what we want. Prayer is the means whereby the Christian aligns his or her will to the will of God. Prayer is not asking God to move towards us as much as it is asking God to move us towards Him. Sometimes we need to be silent in prayer and just listen. Hear His voice. Many years ago, as I was graduating from high school and I was contemplating where to go to school and what career and all these things, several different options. One of them was a comedian. I know that that may shock you. You know, I felt the Lord speaking to me for a long time in life as a little boy about going to the ministry. And so in that season, I remember laying my face before the Lord one day and just saying to God, you know, Lord, these are the, the sacrifices that I've made. And I've been more blessed in ministry than I ever imagined. So this is not a, a complaint statement. But I just said, Lord, if I go into ministry, it means this and it means that and it means this and it means that. And I just went down a list of things that I knew were sacrifices. And you know, I remember, I haven't heard the voice of the Lord this clear many times in my life, but I heard it that day. 
And I heard the Lord say, Chris, yes. That's your cross to bear. Right? Yielding. The Christian life is not about getting our way. It's about God getting his way in our life. That's why Jesus said, if you come after me, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. A part of prayer is being willing after you've laid your prayers before your praise and after you've repented and after you've asked those things to the Lord. A part of prayer is saying, all right, God, now what do you want to say to me? And yielding to it. You know, the most frustrating things to me about the Lord is when I pray about something somebody else has done to me that I think they've wronged me, the Lord never talks to me about them. He always talks to me about me. You know, I learned to just stop bringing guys. I was going to say, you know, because you're like, you know, but you know, but Lord, but Lord, what about, you know, yeah, what about you? You know, what about you? And one time, uh, my wife and I had a, had a fight. You know, in marriage, there's uh, two people fight. There's somebody who's wrong, and then there's a husband. And so... <laughs> I, that was well delivered, wasn't it? I worked hard on that. That was hard on that. And uh, I just think ladies, I know there's just generalizations and I know there are exceptions, but I think just in general, women are just better at relationship. Guys just say stupid stuff. Charlton Hessen was once asked how he had a successful marriage in Hollywood all those years. And he said three little words, I was wrong. It's, I'd say it saved my marriage every day. But anyway, you know, I, I was praying about, I don't even remember what the disagreement was. I think it was something I said I think it was something I said that she misinterpreted. Imagine me saying something could be misinterpreted. And, um, you know, if you think before you talk, you apologize a lot less. But um, I heard the Lord say to me, he said, Chris, do you want to be right or do you want to be reconciled? You know? I, 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 well, can I be both, Lord? <laughs> you know? So prayerful people know that you cannot walk with God and not talk with God. And prayer is praise and it's repentance and it's asking and it's yielding to the Lord. Prayer is within the confines of the word of God. God's not going to answer prayers that are outside the confines of the word of God. He's not going to say, he's not going to provide you a future spouse that doesn't follow him if you're following him. He's not going to do that. You know, he's not going to do that. God's not going to condone sin. He's not going to condone things that are outside of the word of God. So if you ask God about those things, but you know, God's awesome. He's awesome. Sometimes I think in my prayers to God, they remind me of one time in the grocery store, I had my son with me and we were rolling down this aisle and there was, I don't know how, I don't know where it was at, but there was like cartons of, uh, I think it was like cigars or something rolling next to it. And he saw this brightly colored cigar and he's screaming over this thing, you know, and like, I need to have this box of cigars. And I'm like, not till you're at least six years old. I mean, because I'm a disciplined parent. And, 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 I, and, and, you know, and he's lost his mind. You know, I think, God, that must be like me. Here, I'm screaming for something I'm sure I need, and you just know better, right? You just know better. All right. So prayer for people know you cannot walk with God and not talk with God. Unceasing prayer produces people who have certain characteristics. It produces people who are fearless. Do you have a problem with fear? Then I encourage you to pray. Don't be anxious about anything, Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. But in everything, I want you to hear these words. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. You know what that means? That you can be at peace when it doesn't make sense to be at peace. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's a great prayer. I encourage you to learn to pray the Bible over situations. Unceasing prayer produces people who are fearless. It produces people who are wise. You're not uncertain about a situation. You don't know what to do. James says in James 1, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. It will be given her. It will be given. Unceasing prayer produces people who are fearless and wise and before I forget, I look over here at Phil Bennett who helped us start our wall of prayer. I should mention, if you're not with the wall of prayer, please go by the uh, welcome desk and sign up for that. It's a needed thing. Unceasing prayer produces people who are restful. Are you worn out? Are you tired? I love what Jesus said in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. It's not just physical rest. It's a rest of the soul. It's a rest of the mind. It's a rest of the spirit, man. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and we will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Unceasing prayer produces people are fearless and wise and restful and joyful, like Pastor Chad said last week. 
Until now, Jesus said in John 16, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you'll receive and your joy will be complete. Unceasing prayer also produces people who are humble. 1 Peter 5, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. My favorite statements Pastor Chad ever, ever made. He said, arrogance is the only sickness that makes everybody sick but the person who has it. Right? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time... He may exalt you. You're not getting your way. You feel like you deserve better opportunities. You feel like you're not getting your due. The Bible says, instead of pushing yourself out in front, humble yourself before God and trust Him to exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Unceasing prayer produces people who are humble, who are fearless and wise and restful and joyful, and it also produces people who are purpose-filled, purposeful people. People who aren't walking with life through life with no direction. People who know who God has made them to be. People who understand they are His workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared before and that we should walk in them. This is some but not all of the fruits of being prayerful. All right. Prayerful people know that you cannot walk with God and not talk with God. But you would say, Pastor Chris, when should I pray? As often as possible, and I think sometimes in certain seasons when we're very busy, we've got little kids, God bless you moms and dads, got little ones. We feel really guilty because we can't give hours here and hours there. But I'd encourage you as much as possible, set a, set a date time daily with the Lord. And I know you're going to have days you can't get that, whether it's in the morning or the afternoon. Maybe you've got a long commute and it's going to be your drive to work and you're going to just turn everything off maybe put some praise music on and you're just going to talk with the Lord but it's important to pray often there are times in meetings we're dealing with things and I need wisdom just in my own mind without even uttering words I just say alright Lord I need your help Lord I need you right here would you give me wisdom Nehemiah said when the king looked at him and said Nehemiah why are you sad ne- it said Nehemiah wrote, it said, and I asked the Lord of heaven he didn't stop because if he'd stopped they'd been rude to the king and then you could lose your life for that kind of uh, Behavior, I think Nehemiah in his own mind just said, all right, Lord, here we go. I need your help. I need courage. You can pray everywhere and anywhere. When, where, should, where should you pray everywhere? When should you pray as often as possible? C.H. Spurgeon said prayer can never be in excess. What should I pray about? Everything. Everything. Everything, Pastor is? Everything. That's what the Word of God says. How should I pray expectantly? was at an event this week, Thursday night, and there was a North Carolina state legislature, uh, senator, pardon me, that was here, and she was giving, uh, she believed her, she was giving a testimony. And she talked a little bit about prayer. She said something very interesting. She said, you know, I was asked a few years ago to pray over some part of one of the legislative sessions there in the Senate. So she stood up and she prayed, and as she made her way after the prayer was over back to her spot on the Senate floor, a colleague stopped her and leaned over, said to her, you know, I, I've never heard somebody pray like that before in this place. And she said something, and it might sound arrogant, but I don't think it was arrogant, just confident. She just looked at him and said, well, Senator, I know who I'm talking to. Amen. You can pray to a lot of things, a lot of gods, a lot of stuff. But who you're praying to is really important. And prayer is based in relationship. Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. That literally in the Greek means keep asking. Seek, literally in the Greek, keep seeking and you will find. Knock, in the Greek, keep knocking and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Sometimes we don't pray because we don't understand how much God loves us. 
Hebrews 4 says, For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We should pray expectantly. Prayerful people know you cannot walk with God and not talk with God. I've heard this story. I've seen the photographic evidence of it, so I believe it's true. That when John Kennedy was president of the United States, the little John Jr. would wander down as a little boy the halls of the White House, past Secret Service agents, past staff and administrators, past individuals who were waiting to see the President of the United States. And he would wander right past the secretaries and right into the Oval Office. He'd go right up to the office, to the desk, and he'd sit in his dad's lap, or there's a photo of him sitting underneath his desk. I thought, you know, that's an image, I think, of God. Because I think sometimes we think God is too important that he doesn't want to hear us, but I don't think it's the opposite of that. I think you are his children, and I think we have access to the Oval Office of God, to the throne of God, anytime we want. Because he loves us. Amen. We can give God praise for that. But I want to close by asking this. Do you know who you're talking to? There's probably somebody in the sound of my voice today that has never made a decision to be a follower of Jesus. And it's not to be decided lightly. Jesus says, if you're going to come and follow him, you must not deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. You know, we, we, I mentioned earlier in the message that our relationship with God is like a marriage, right? You know, when people walk down, when a bride walks down an aisle, that's a, that's a significant lifelong commitment. And when you commit to follow Christ, it's a, it's a significant thing. But it's also a few simple words. You know, in a marriage ceremony, a bride and groom just repeat some things and it's just words. And after that, they're married. So right where you're at here, you could simply ask the Lord to come into your life. And you could say, Lord, I, I know that I make a lot of mistakes. The Bible calls those things sin. And because of those things, Lord, I, I'm separated from you. But your word says that you love me and you sent your son to die for me because I can't be perfect and your standard is perfection. But by the blood of your son, Jesus, I am justified. I am made right in your eyes because God so loved who? The world, right? You and I. And that you can just say, Lord, would you come into my life and be my Lord and Savior, my leader and the forgiver of my life. And you can start a relationship with him today. And I challenge you, if you've never made that decision, that today's your day. Would you please stand with me? So do you know who you're talking to? Prayerful people know they cannot walk with God and not talk with God. That's the whole point of the message today. But there's probably also some folks in here that have said, but Pastor Chris, I have prayed and prayed and prayed over this situation and God has not moved. And I've stood bedside watching a little boy die, prayed to his last breath that the Lord would revive him. I've been right there. I know what it's like to be in scenarios and situations in which you wonder where God is, but I can tell you this. No matter how difficult your situation, no matter whether or not God is answering the prayer the way you want him to, if you're a follower of Christ, you are not home yet. This life is not the end. God can be trusted. His character is good. That gentleman that wrote that song we sang earlier today, earlier this morning, I believe you the God of miracles wrote it when his young boy died. So I understand that some of you are even resentful and angry against God, but I want to challenge you today to take that anger and hurt and lay it before the Lord. I want to challenge you today that God is still moving and answering prayers. We buried my 93-year-old grandfather this year. He resisted God his whole life, one month before he died. One month, I called him up, and he prayed a prayer of salvation with me, and he sat in a hospice room for a whole month. And he said things like, I never knew I could feel like this before. I feel like a weight has been lifted off my shoulders. He lifted his hands up in the bed and he said to my mom, I never knew why people do this, but I know it now. I'm telling you folks, your Redeemer lives. And if you need a miracle today, I believe that God can meet you. I'd like to ask the elders and pastors and deacons and their spouses to come right now. Because how I want to close this, and also I've got two people from the starting point team right here, Gail, 
and Tony, and they would love to talk with you about making a decision to follow Jesus. But there are others in this room right now that you need to come right now because you need a miracle. You need God to touch you this morning. And as we sing this song, I believe in you. I want you to come down here today and get prayer and give this to God. Let's begin to sing this song. Come on, come right now.